Okay, perfect. All right, so I think we're ready to start then. Okay, so let's start. So we have an invited speaker from uh, University of Waterloo in Canada. And uh, Professor Ari Garfinkel is here to talk about verifying verified code, very much into the topic of our group and uh, other group working in the similar area. All right, so let's start. All right. Uh, well, thank you for uh, having me. Thank you for coming to the talk. This is a small group, so please uh, like interrupt, ask questions. I don't have to go through all of my slides. Uh, I'd rather answer your questions or jump to things that are more interesting too. So this is a, a joint work with a number of people. I guess some of this works. So let's see how, there you go. So it's a uh, work with this group of people. So I'll tell you a little bit about them. So this is on the left here is Siddhar Spriya. He's a PhD student with me at Waterloo. He is uh, really the main driver behind this work. Uh, and then uh, Jiang was a master's student with me during this time, and he's now at Intel. Yusen is still a PhD student with me. He works more on abstract interpretation, which I've before been using, but I won't be talking much about. Uh, and then Yuan Bao, who was a postdoc with me now, she's in Augusta. Uh, Yakir is a professor in techno. And so I decided that I'm not going to motivate uh, so sort of why we do program verification much. I figured that it's not really needed here. So believe me, program verification, really important. We all use software, it crushes all the time. Really, really needed. When I started uh, my graduate studies, it was power plants will melt down and will kill us all. We really need good software. Now it's like, uh, you know, you invest in crypto and all of your money will be wiped out. You really need, need verification. So really needed. This is ideally what we want to do, is we want to build this uh, fancy box. We take a program, maybe some spec, maybe some implicit spec, fit them into this box, and the box automatically tells you're good to go. Oh, here's your bug, here's your counter example, figure it out. That's what we always want. Unfortunately, we have this guy, uh, Turing, who told us, well, you can't just have it. You can't have this box, uh, it's undecidable. You can't have a computer program that does this without any restrictions. So we always have to have some kind of a limitation. Something has to, to give. Either we're not really doing real programs, for example, finite state, not programs uh, completely, so maybe no loops, or uh, programs completely, loops and everything, but we're gonna have procedure that sometimes does not terminate. Uh, I always put this in my talks. Um, I don't know, maybe by now everybody already knows. Uh, but at some point, uh, um, ISER was shown this and was really amazed uh, and keep putting on my talk to publicize. But uh, an interesting thing, so everybody knows how it's doing. Everybody knows about uh, that the halting problem is undecidable. Not that many people know that Turing also had um, uh, uh, been thinking about what to do about it. Uh, and in 1949, uh, he had a paper uh, where he was just basically asking a question. I've written this program that computes a factorial. How do I convince anybody that the program is correct? And he came up with a notion of an inductive invariant, the fact that uh, the programmer has to provide them, the fact that it's maybe feasible to check that invariant is inductive, even so inferring it is not. And then this was in 1949. And then this was totally forgotten. It was published in some small workshop. I guess not many people have read it. And then you know, Tony Hoare came and redid really everything in a different way. That's sort of what we know, the Hoare-Floyd uh, verification. But it actually comes from Turing. And in 1984, uh, there was a, a paper sort of providing a really nice exposition of it. So showing the old paper of Turing, the current papers, and really showing how, how far ahead it's time to report. And yeah, but this doesn't really relate to, to my talk, just Turing is great, should learn more about it. Now, um, I don't know if I need this slide here, but I often have it as well, just to uh, sort of separate where I fit, where my work fits and uh, what automatic verification is. So there is these two uh, directions to go. This one, deductive and algorithmic. I, I'm an, an algorithmic. And uh, sometimes people who do algorithmic don't think that this is uh, automated. But in fact, people who do this, and in fact, it is uses a lot of automation. So there's two ways to go. One is when you want to really prove that the program is correct. 
Uh, you don't want to limit yourself in any way. You say, I'm going to define what it means to be correct, and I'm going to show that the program meets the specification. And I know this problem is undecidable. I'm not going to try and automate the whole problem, but I'm going to use as much automation as possible so that I don't have to worry uh, whether I made a mistake in any of my steps or not. And this is deductive verification where you, the programmer, or the, the ver verification experts, you get to design the argument and you get to put this argument into some system and you're going to guide the proof to show that this argument is correct. At the end of the day, you have a mechanical proof <laughs> and a mechanical thing that can check that proof and maybe big steps in that proof that are fairly complicated that are automatic, but you get to guide this proof. So if you formulate the problem one way, it may be very easy. You formulate it in another way, it may be very hard. You formulate it in a third way, you may not be even proving what you think you're proving. But you still have a lot of automation under the hood to sort of make you jump from one place to another as quickly as possible. And then there is an algorithmic verification. This is so where I come from. Uh, this is where so model checking is coming uh, from. The idea is that verification should be push button. And by that, it means that the user specifies the specification at a very high level. My program should be memory six, no undefined behaviors. Uh, I give you a specification as some high-level property, airplane doesn't crash. The system has to figure out by itself how to break it down into simple properties, how to analyze it, and how to give you a result. So I just do high-level specification and everything else is relevant. Of course, given everything that uh, we know in theory and also in practice, that means that I'm going to give up the kind of properties I check. Right? So I'm only going to be checking properties which are more sort of shallow, maybe properties which are more generic. So for example, I can go after memory safety, design a lot of automation specific to memory safety, and that's what's gonna make it scale. Uh, as opposed to here, where for each individual specification, I can figure out the right obstruction. Uh, but I have to put my own uh, effort into it. All right. So um, since, I think about 2015, uh, I've been working on one of those automated systems. It's called Seahorn uh, and has a cool web page, has a cool source code on GitHub. Uh, you can try and play with it. Uh, this is what this talk is going to be about, about some parts of the stream. Uh, it started, it's called Seahorn because it started uh, as a, a really a prototype to see if we can do program verification using constrained horn clauses. But over the years, it grew so much. The name stuck, but it's much more than that. Uh, this is a, sort of a rough um, uh, picture of the different components. So it starts uh, here. Uh, it is initially was designed for analyzing C code, maybe C++ code. There's some uh, questions uh, about it. More specifically, C++ code that is kind of like C code under the hood we like, and C++ code, which is very much unlike C code we don't like. So that means, for example, you use lots of templates, all kinds of things like this that all get compiled away by the front-end compiler. We're very happy with it. Using a lot of inheritance, virtual function calls, it progressively gets less and less useful. Uh, so this is uh, the front-end uh, from the name. Uh, and this name, you already see that we built on top of LLVM uh, compiler. And again, there's a, a debate. How do you build your verification framework? What do you take as ground truth? Do you go with uh, the language and you say a language like C has some semantics, I'm going to build a tool that respects the semantics? Or you say, no, 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 the languages don't have semantics. Nobody knows what they are. It's just maybe some researchers fight about what the semantics of a language is. But what there is is a programmers and they use tools. And programmers, a lot of them, use uh, the Clang compiler, it comes as part of LLVM project, and they know what this thing does. And um, they know what kind of assembly generate. They know what works, what doesn't. And so, if, for example, Clang does something which is not formally according to the C semantics. Programmers will use it. And if you get give them another compiler that does not do this, they will complain and will say, this is not, not what I expect. This is called the de facto semantics. There are papers on this as well to show that. Uh, so an example of a de facto semantics would be uh, in C, it is illegal to compare two pointers if they come from a different object. Okay, so if you do malloc, do another malloc, and then you say, is this pointer different from this pointer? 
That's undefined behavior. You can do that. The semantic set. Yeah. Of course, most compilers will say, no problem. That's a number. That's a number. I can compare. Uh, and it just works because it's really hard for a compiler to know where is allocated object. And there's a lot of design patterns where programmers do this. For example, they say, uh, I'm supposed to get a pointer and it's supposed to be a pointer in my hash table. A hash table is uh, you know, that, that big. So from a pointer, I can check whether it is inside my hash table. If it is, then I know it's a good pointer. Otherwise, it's a bad pointer and I do something, something else. And there is code like this, and it works because on any normal compiler, it works. And therefore, people assume that the semantics. And that's why, for example, a project like Clang, when they started, uh, and, and still to this day, there's a lot of synchronization between Clang and GCC, right? So it's not enough to say, ooh, I work according to the C standard. It's really important, and I, you can use me instead of GCC, and your code will work the same way, because of the system. So this was all to say that, uh, so we decided that we're going to live uh, inside at this end. So our verification happens after the compilation, after uh, uh, we're already in a compiler land. The benefit is that we verify exactly what runs, what the compiler sees it. The downside is, of course, if there's an undefined behavior in your program, something that you kind of want to check for, but it gets exploited by the compiler, we don't get to see that. Right? So for example, if uh, the compiler says, I see this is uh, an out of um, uh, memory access, uh, and therefore I can maybe compile this whole function into nothing because undefined behavior allows me to do so. We won't see it if we're not here. Okay. Our argument for why this is okay is because we check what actually runs. We want to go for some with deeper properties. Uh, and uh, we use a compiler with very uh, few optimizations in it. And at least Clang is designed in such a way that this step from C to out loses very little information and doesn't try to do a lot of optimization. And then afterwards, a lot of optimization happens uh, once it's in an intermediate trip. All right. And so, uh, right. So there's a, a lot of things in here. I'm not going to talk about all of them. This is not, uh, um, not a talk about Seahorn. The only uh, reason why this is here is to point out that what I'm going to talk about today is our experience with this component. This is our newest component, a bounded model checking something that we were avoiding to do for many years, looking at other parts. Uh, but uh, at some point, uh, so if it, it became apparent that that's needed. And there is no, at least at that time, there wasn't any good competition. So that's what we saw. So what is bounded model checking? I'm sure you all know what it is. This is a small group. Uh, but I wanted to point out some things which maybe uh, are not as apparent. At least uh, they weren't um, uh, all that to me. Is that uh, uh, one of the big things about bounded model checking is that it's super easy to use compared to lots of other verification techniques. And the reason why is because it's super precise. Super precise means that it models the semantics of code exactly how the programmer thinks the semantics of code works. Which means if you give it to a programmer and you explain to them what they need to do in order to use it, they can use all of their experience in programming to do something. In a bad case, it's going to be slow. In a bad case, they may formalize something in such a way that it's going to be really hard for the BMC engine to solve. But that's they already know. They know that when they write code, especially if they're good programmers, that for certain architectures, some code is really slow and you need to write it in certain other ways. So they know how to change code that it has the same functionality but maybe uses different components to make it somehow better. What they know much less, which is what is uh, the, the, the cons of lots of other techniques, is when the technique uh, is not precise. And in order to use it, you need to understand the technique in order to understand how to avoid the imprecision. Okay. So if you look at abstract interpretation, uh, or you look at you know, solving something with uh, horn clauses, the engine that we have, um, for example, with horn clauses, we say, we're going to model memory very loosely. And so if you want to maintain something in memory, you have to be very careful. You can't have any in-memory data structures, because every time you write to memory, it basically disappears up to a point. And now it gets to be really hard, because you do a very simple example, it works. You do a more complicated example, I come out and I say up to a point, and here where the point is. 
but it's not as easy to explain uh, to somebody who is not developing these techniques. So we often had this experience where um, people try something with Seahorn and then they come and say, oh, this is the report. And you explain to them and they're very surprised, like, well, how come like this little thing works and this one doesn't? And I can't explain it in a very simple ways. Whereas with BMC, everything works. And then oh, how come it's slow? Well, it's slow because like you're using a hash table and you're storing things. And so we need to like model that, that, that. Oh, okay, I can try and not use the hash table. Okay, so it's much easier. So that, uh, that, that's sort of uh, uh, an interesting thing, uh, which is part of what this talk is about, that it's really easy to use, really easy to give to developers. Uh, uh, it scales to some amount, uh, and then uh, it require, it does require some, uh, some, to be effective, it does require some, some things. Uh, so this is, again, what part of this talk is about, what does that require? We can't just uh, take a bounded model checker, take a program, throw it on it, and say it work. We do need to give it like a unit test, like I think. Uh, this is roughly uh, the flow. Again, I'm assuming you kind of know this. Uh, we start with a compiler. We use a lot of AM. This is a lot of work with, uh, what Seahorn is doing, getting this verification conditions in some SMT form. And then we throw it to a solver. We usually use this two. Why this two? Well, we use these three because uh, in a lot of our other engines, this three is super important. And that's what we know. So that, that's what we like. Uh, we use the X2 because we had um, uh, collaborators who used to work very close with the X. Uh, and actually amazing. It's, it's a highly underrated. It's really, really amazing solver. Uh, we can add others. Uh, we just did, didn't get a chance to. Uh, we prefer to integrate solvers quite deep. Uh, and that's why it's uh, sort of difficult for us. We can use other solvers through the SMT text interface. And we do for testing. But I don't put them here because uh, it's just you know, you create a text file, you dump it out yourself. It's not really what's supported. Uh, there is a lot of competition in this space. Uh, again, you probably know. Uh, I haven't put any of your tools here. Sorry. It wasn't. Uh, these are really tools that we sort of uh, compare with. Uh, I can defend why they're here in particular, but not others. But it's really just to, to showcase a few things. Uh, there is CBMC, that one everybody knows. It's uh, very old. That's the tool in this space for C. Uh, the reason why it says here is because we're going to compare a lot with it. That's sort of what motivated uh, a big chunk of our work. Uh, there is CLI, uh, and CLI is interesting because it's not a BMC engine, it's a symbolic execution engine. So it has different uh, trade offs. It tries to get um, all the way through the code without necessarily trying to cover all the code, but at the same time trying to even uh, process things which may be very hard to process symbolically by under approximating them, by running them concretely. But it fits really well here because it's also on the LVM. And ideally, you'd want to be able to use both a BMC engine and a symbolic execution engine on the same piece of code, which I'm going to show you that you can actually do this in production. and. Uh, we've done it, and I can show what sort of the takeaway lessons are. There is SMAC, uh, which is a, a BMC engine for LLVM as well, but this one is based on Microsoft um, uh, infrastructure. So it goes not to an SMT file, but to Boogie, I think, uh, and then through that infrastructure. Uh, it actually uses some of our components, and so the fun uh, thing to compare what you can build out of similar components to us. Uh, and then there is symbiotic, uh, which sort of has some of the uh, intuitions that we also use, which is like that you have to slice things to get scalability, but it's based on CLI, uh, and it's uh, been really well performing in SMB comp. So we, well, we were asked to put it in here so that we can compare it with SMB All right, so uh, hopefully I'll have some more time to talk about this guy, which is our uh, new BMC tool. Uh, as you see, we're very creative with names, so we call it CBMC. So if you ask me how CBMC is different from CBMC, CBMC is better. Uh, we, we, we usually say we just use Seahorn, uh, but uh, anyhow. Uh, uh, this is um, uh, the two big things that I knew in it. It's, uh, I, I really like how we design it so that we can have very different encodings. So in the spectrum of uh, VC gens, I see there's a difference between how Boogie does it 
and how CBMC does it. And we're able to do it in either way with one code base in a nice layered approach, which I'll get to at the end. So that was like really uh, cool to me that through very simple program transformations uh, and a very simple VCGen, you can actually sort of target both and then you can compare which one is better and, and how. Uh, and then this thing, which I think there's more of it now, somehow there wasn't before, uh, but still it's not that, that big, uh, is that um, if you're building a, a symbolic engine, you can extend your underlying computer architecture to do things which make it easier for you to specify verification conditions. And again, I'll get to it um, in the second half of the talk. But before that, uh, I want to talk about our uh, case study. So we started building this uh, BMC engine, uh, mostly because uh, there's also an interesting story. Uh, so you may know nowadays that fuzzing is really big. And a fun thing to do if you uh, want to make people life difficult is you find a verification engine and you start fuzzing it. Okay, you pick Z3 and you start fuzzing that, you pick my tools, you start fuzzing them. And what you do is you create small programs that don't work how you expect. And you just flood the developer with those programs. And then you get explanations, especially as I said, when the tools are not precise that well, like this doesn't fit into the abstractions we have. Don't do this, like take bigger programs that fit our abstractions, don't fit small ones. But after a while, you get tired of answering this and you're saying, well, if you have small programs, you should be using a BMC engine. We just don't have one. And after a while, you start saying, well, we have one. Just had to build one for you. Uh, and so that's what we were doing. We we're building this BMC engine, mostly for fun, mostly to quiet down the fathers so that they can't complain that the tools don't work. Uh, and then uh, this happened. Uh, so this is, um, uh, there was a paper, but before that there was, um, uh, 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 an open source release from AWS uh, called um, AWS C Common. So this is a library from AWS that uh, implements in C a lot of the basic data structures. So there is uh, all kinds of buffers that resize, lists, uh, linked lists, uh, a ring, a hash table, this kind of thing. And of course, uh, this uh, um, data structures is super important because everything else you want to build, you're going to use those data structures. And any critical component you build, like crypto or something like that, that you build in C, you end up using those components. And if there is a bug in one of those components, especially something that's exploitable, you compromise everything. And so uh, people at Amazon uh, were looking at how they're going to use formal verification. And one of the things that they decided to do is they have CBMC. It's easy to use. It's very precise. It checks for a lot of little things. Let's go and analyze this library. And so they got a bunch of interns and a bunch of researchers, and they've written uh, a comprehensive verification suite for this library. Found a whole bunch of interesting things um, that, that um, you can read in the paper related to overflow and, and things like that. Got to be part of the team. Uh, the team really liked it and sort of continued to maintain it. And then they released all of this into the public. So you go to this uh, website, uh, to this GitHub repo, there's a directory that was recently renamed, maybe it's called proofs or verification. And this directory is full of these jobs you can like, see and uh, actually try them out. And this was fantastic because for the most uh, time up to this point, uh, this is the only one that I know, if you know others, I'd be interested to know, is that you hear that people apply verification tools in industry, but usually it's under a big secret. So it's code that nobody should ever see, or we found bugs, but we're never going to tell you. Definitely not going to be released to the open. This one, the code is open. The verification effort is open. It's all backed up by CI, so this is easy to run in a Docker. And they use it. It actually runs nightly, checks you know, whatever commits they do, keeps rechecking them. And so we said, OK, this is going to be really cool. We're going to take this. Uh, and because uh, of how it's all done, we're going to just uh, take uh, Seahorn, uh, replace CBMC by CBMC. It's just going to work. It's going to be a case study. It'll take us like two months with some students. And uh, so two years later, uh, this is where I am. So it ended up actually a lot uh, harder. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about why uh, it was a bit harder. 
Uh, it was really amazing because we were able to completely replicate it. So do all the features, do a complete replacement, uh, add many other tools, uh, other than just the original tool, uh, and actually show, uh, I'm not gonna talk about this here, but if you look into uh, our repo, that's also interesting, is how do you integrate with a build system? How do you integrate with live code? It's not an SV comp like experience where you have some pre-processed files and you're trying to understand like how to even just read them. Uh, you have real code, you have build instructions. Uh, you can think of how it would be a clean way if you need to replace something by stops, how you're gonna manage them, how they're gonna be part of a build system, how you use standard build tools to link things in such a way that you have one link for verification, another link for production. And so that's, that's really nice. So uh, um, uh, this is uh, the first thing that we sort of uh, saw in that case study. And, and we decided to really uh, argue for it, give it a name and, and, and so, uh, really go after it and understand what it is. And that is the use of code as a specification language. If you've ever used uh, CBMC or any kind of model checker like this, you know that there is no extra specification language. You just use um, a program code to write whatever specifications. Uh, and that's an interesting uh, uh, thing to sort of uh, consider, look at and double down on to say that I already have code. People know how to write code. People know how to structure code. People know how to abstract code. They know how to reuse code. Why do I need something else to do my specifications? I might as well have all of my specification as executable code. What you need for this, uh, it means that uh, you have the structure, uh, you're structuring everything around something which we call unit proofs. I'll show in a second, but that's basically like unique tests, except that your uh, preconditions are symbolic and your post conditions may have non-determinism in it. Uh, you have, um, and you have to extend the programming language with extra primitives to be able to do those symbolic things. How do you get symbolic inputs in? How do you check? So you need something like assume and assert. Um, I wonder what slides I'm showing you. Okay. I, I, I did an update on the slides in the morning and you will see the updates uh, for me too. So, but um, I'm updated here. Maybe this is a new enough slide. So here's an example of uh, a unit proof. Uh, so it has different colors. Uh, this is what they're for. So first, uh, so what, what are we first of all doing? I'm not going to go from top, uh, but like from what's the important part. Uh, in this thing, we have this function. Uh, you can, from the name, guess what it's doing. So AWS is because it's written by AWS. Array list is because it's for the array list data structure. Capacity it happens to be a function that uh, returns the capacity of a list, how much memory it has allocated. Uh, and it takes list as an argument. So this is the function we want to test. Whenever you call a function by default, memory safety is checked. So if you don't say anything else, you just call a function uh, and the unit proof works. It means that the, the system is memory safe. And then in addition to this, well, you need to somehow tell it what to run it to, what kind of list. That has to be specified. Ideally, you want to say any list. But any list is a complicated thing. How do you say any list? Well, where is this list in memory? You may decide where to put it. How big is this list? How many elements? You could say, I don't care how many, but some verification jobs will very much depend on how many elements you have. It'll get harder, more elements there is. You can't just have arbitrary. So you need to balance those things. You want to say at least, uh, okay, of uh, some unknown number of elements, uh, but maybe no more than 10. The value of elements probably doesn't matter, this kind of things. Uh, and so you're gonna package this, you're gonna say this somehow, you're gonna write it either as a, a construction of a list or as some kind of assumptions. And then eventually once you figure out what you want, you're gonna package it down into some function to call that basically creates that list. This is what this is. Like say initialize bounded array list is just a bunch of C code that creates a list. By default, they think our size is 10. Uh, so it creates a list of size up to 10. Uh, because uh, the creation of a list really only cares about memory, because we want to model memory a bit more precisely. 
So it only cares about uh, that the list you know, is allocated properly. Uh, it may miss um, some of the representation invariant. For example, that lens has to be less than capacity, this kind of things. This is all done by uh, this function. So now once we have initialization, we have precondition. For example, uh, array list is valid. It's actually not a verification function. It's a testing function. Right. So I teach uh, a compilers class uh, and we have it uh, in there. I tell all my students, like you create a new data structure, you write a method. In our case, it's called rep OK. That just checks your basic representational invariance. And then you call this method everywhere, especially when you test. So that if something is broken in your data structure at the core, you discover it early. And it's not like a broken data structure, you use it for a bit and then later it crashes and you don't quite know why. So this array list is valid is actually a function that is now used by uh, the library in its tests, in various assertions, uh, if you want to compile code with assertion. Uh, but as a side effect, all it does, it uh, checks that, for example, lens is less than capacity, that the data array is not null, this kind of thing. And we simply assume it. And so now we have this partial initialization and this assumption makes it good enough so that uh, if you have a counter example, it looks reasonable. Uh, and then uh, there's a few extra things, which uh, for example, this one doesn't uh, like the item size, which is the size of an item in the list. And then at the end we have the assertions, right? And so for example, here we check that the representation invariant hasn't been broken. That's one assertion. And then we check an assertion that, well, the capacities that we get is actually the capacities that we expect. Right? Because uh, here it's a list. So you have a bunch of data uh, and you have a list, you have how many elements you have in the list and then the size of each element. So the capacity should be allocated data size over the um, number of elements, uh, oh, sorry, over the, the size of each element. So that's our unit proof. So this is what uh, CAS gives us. It gives us an ability to, uh, I mean, this is, so what you need, and that's the ability. So you need to be able to take a function, create an environment for it. Uh, the creation of an environment is easy enough to explain to developers so that once they see how to do it, they can continue and do it themselves. Uh, Amazon says developers, I don't know about developers, but I know master students, easy to explain, and, and they uh, can do it quite effectively. Um, all right, so I think that slide we've covered. Uh, okay, so we started with this, uh, and so we had the three questions that we wanted uh, to answer. Or more like we started with this, we wanted just to do a quick um, benchmarking study, uh, but then we ended up spending two years on it. And so then we said, well, what questions should we have asked before so that uh, the work that we've done can be presented as an answer to questions? Uh, and this is the three questions. Uh, so one claim was that with code as spec, one of the benefits of it is that not just that the developers understand it, tools understand it. If I have a specific language, something specific to a tool, I can't move from one bounded model checker to another. I can't go from a, a symbolic tool to say a father because the language is different. But if it's the same, um, uh, if it's code, code is code, everybody understands. So the claim was uh, even in original uh, work that you should be able to use other tools. So now we can actually give this answer because we've done the study. We started with CBMC and we did Seahorn and then we uh, connected uh, a whole bunch of other tools like CLI and Smart and Symbiotic on the same um, on the same code base. And so the answer here uh, is this, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that is in fact the case, but uh, there's two caveats and they're really important. One is uh, semantics, okay? So I've sort of talked about this before, but I'll, I'll show you again. If you're using code specification, you need to agree what its meaning is. And it's better be the meaning that developers have, not some other meaning you invent. Because otherwise, uh, the same different in language will just manifest itself as different in the semantics. And the second uh, is that um, uh, if you want to do it, um, uh, in order to say write papers or in order to create competitions, it's easy. But this is not what you should want to do. What you should want to do is you want to say, uh, I have my uh, unit proof, like I want to verify this guy. 
and I have a tool, say click. What is the best way for me to use Cli for this? You could do an easy way where you'd say, uh, oh, I know what's the best way uh, to do here to use uh, Seahorn. And then I'll take the same thing, I'll give it to Cli, and I show how terrible Cli is. Mm -hmm. Because I start with obstructions which are really good for bounded model checker, really terrible for symbolic execution. Look how great I am. Uh, you can do that, that's very easy. It's harder to think, uh, what am I going to do so that I get something that is, you know, it's not going to be apples to apples comparison. I don't want to say uh, this is how much CLI will take to do the same job that say, Seahorn does. But how do you do it so that you get the best of CLI? With it, it's all like it's going to analyze slightly different problems, slightly different specification. The implicit specifications will be different. But how to get it uh, to actually work close? So that's uh, this. Uh, then the next question is, uh, well, so the idea of uh, using all of those tools on all of this code is that we can verify the code. The code will be verified. Verified code is good because of what? What should verify code not have? Yeah. Bugs. Does it? Right, so that's an interesting question. And, and here, we were surprised. So we were uh, assumed that for sure there are no bugs because the code is really simple. Like you look at it, every function is just, it's really, really simple. And a whole bunch of really, really smart people from CBMC team tried to find all kinds of bugs in it. And I'm sure they found even without tools just by eyeballing and then showed how tools help with this. By now, we shouldn't be able to find any bugs. Surprisingly, we actually found, uh, we found bugs in specification, right? If you use code as specification, if you use code, you make bugs. If you use code as specification, you make bugs in specification. And so remarkably, we found bugs in specification. So there could have been bugs in code. There they weren't. We didn't find any, uh, almost. Uh, but, um, uh, um, but that wasn't because it's verified. It was just happens to me. How do you make sure that there is no bug in this? You have a verifier, verify your code, and the verifier says no bug. But uh, if there is a bug, that verifier doesn't detect. Uh, if there is a, well, um, so a verifier is designed to check for, say, a class of bugs. So, for example, our verifier is designed to automatically check for memory safety. Uh, and so, if a code passes the verifier, I guarantee memory safety of what is verified. Oh, so, but... so I'm not going to miss that part. But some specifications, uh, users get to write. So you get to write a precondition. For example, say you write a precondition that's always false. Or say you write a precondition where you only check what happens to non-empty lists. And you forget to write the precondition for an empty list. Uh -huh. Then that would not be checked. And, and that's it. So we not. So it's even at that point where uh, we know exactly what we're checking. We're sure that the verifier will check everything. But because you write specification as code, you can make mistakes in that code. Then how do you check that code? How did you find bugs in specifications, basically? The question that you write is I'll show right, you. Get there. I'll show in a second. Uh, and, 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 and there's also this other thing that we did find actual genuine bugs. Uh, so some bugs we found, uh, especially in the verification part, Verification team went crazy and they said, wow, I, we're going to review all of our stuff and, and, and fix lots of things. And then we found genuine bug, like I'm 100% sure it's a bug in production code. And the production team looked and said, but it works. And, and, and as far as I know, it's still there. <laughs> and then the other part is uh, whether we can improve things. Uh, and uh, the answer is uh, yes, uh, but it's difficult because in order to improve things, we need to have new specifications. Uh, and now we serve adding new code, new libraries, and then uh, the first part uh, will be broken. So uh, semantics. This is uh, the unit proof from CBMC. This is how it looks like. Uh, who can tell me what's wrong in here? So if you look a little bit, what you're going to discover here, you have this list L. Nowhere in this code, uh, L is uh, uh, allocated or written to. There is this uh, assume here, this is list is bounded. This is some Boolean function that takes uh, an address of that list, looks through it and says yes or no. 
never writes to. Uh, ensure allocate the data member uh, also just an assumption. Okay. This index, uh, it's used in here. It's never um, uh, it's never written to. Why is this works? Well, so first of all, what, what, what was the intention? The intention is that you want to create as quickly as possible a data structure that looks okay and is uninitialized as possible so that you can check for as many possible executions as possible. Mm -hmm. And CBMC, the decision was made that if a, a local variable is uninitialized, that means it has non-determinism in it. That is not the C semantics. The C semantics, if something is uninitialized, you can't use it. Okay. So you take this piece of code and you say, this looks like C, programmers understand it. A good programmer will say, I have no clue what's happening. You give it to a C compiler, the C compiler will say, I have no clue what's going on here. This is uninitialized. I don't know, I can't, can't do it. So you can't use this with different tools. Nor can you really claim that uh, you can explain to a developer what to do. Now, is it clear how the tool knows that here uh, list means uh, non-deterministic, but when you call a function like uh, this one, list get at pointer, that inside this function, that's production code, that's the one that should be compiled by C. That should not have uninitialized variables. Right? Because this whole thing is given as one big thing to CBMC. So what CBMC does? So CBMC uh, allows you to have uninitialized variables yeah, and it will treat them as non-deterministic. So any it will allow any value. Whereas what it should do, it should reject this program and say this program is buggy. We, we just can't do it. Okay. Uh, and so the problem happens is that uh, if you give it to CBMC, so the problem is that because CBMC has this little feature, which is perfectly fine because no C program will ever use this feature. It will never use uninitialized memory. That's fine. Every good C program should have all the memory initial. But now they're starting to use this explicitly in unit proofs. So if you tell uh, programmers, your code is your specification, go ahead, write this kind of unit proofs like this, then now I have to teach the programmer inside this unit proof, if you want to have symbolic input that is, comes out of nowhere, just make sure it's declared, but not initialized. That's not what programmers know how to do. So our, the fix is, uh, is pretty, well, it's both easy and not easy. It's easy because uh, all you have to do is you have to say, uh, let's initialize everything. And so it, it's easy because you just initialize. It wasn't easy. We actually had to rewrite all of the unit proofs, all of the 160. We had to quite significantly rewrite them to add this initialization. In. Uh, we had to introduce uh, this new function called memhavoc, uh, which uh, basically says, uh, um, fill this guy with that many non-deterministic bytes. And actually pretty hard to support in a symbolic tool uh, effectively. Uh, but now with this memhawk and explicit initialization, we can create all data structures and explicitly initialize them. So we have to introduce a lot of this kind of calls. You know, the ND size T, which creates a non-deterministic value of size T uh, and, and change the unit proofs to physically low. So that one. Uh, two uh, is if you want to go and then use it for different tools, you have for each tool to come up with the right thing to do. So for example, this is a really good way to get uh, non-deterministic values into C4. You say, I have lens capacity, they have random size, of non-deterministic size, and by the way, lens is less than capacity, capacity less than maximum of Add assumptions. Great, I just get these two little constraints, they just get stuck in uh, and um, uh, into my VC, it's all nice. Say you want to do the same thing, but now you want to use a leap father. Leap father is a fuzzing framework inside the LLVM. Uh, it get, get, takes a source of randomness, feeds it into your program, uh, and uh, monitors what happens, and based on what's covered, changes and gives it more randomness. It also needs an entry point, so unit proofs are really nice entry points. And all you have to do is you're going to replace this ND size T for a father, you'll implement them by go to the father, get randomness. Okay, so the father technically produces a randomness by giving you a big array of random values at each test. And so in our case, ND size T just goes into this array and 
takes a chunk out of it. You give this to lib fuzzer, it's simply not going to cover anything. Because if we give this to lib fuzzer, the way we would do it is we'd say, okay, get a random value, get a random value, check that these assumptions work. If they don't, abort the test, go get new random values. And if they do, continue. Right. And that's, of course, going to be terrible because, you know, what is the probability that you have two numbers that satisfy this constraint? So for the father, you'd want to design your code this way, where you want to say, okay, I need capacity and lens such that they're random and that capacity is less than lens. Well, then I can, instead of just checking for this, I can just compute it, right? I can take my capacity has to be no more than my uh, largest size. So I might, might as well do modular uh, pointing down. And then lens, it happens to be, um, uh, if lens happens to be bigger than capacity, then again, just take modular capacity. When I had run this code, I every iteration, no matter what my random values, I'm gonna get here and do some test. You give this to Seahorn, it's gonna be terrible. It's gonna say, look, you have this nonlinear division. This is so complicated. I just thought solvers don't make it. And so that means whenever you design this code, you now have to use your programming skills to design it in the right way so that uh, you can factor these blue lines and green lines somehow out so that you can link in an implementation that works well for symbolic tools for symbolic tools and you can link another implementation for another. Not super hard, but it, it, it took us a while to sort of understand this. It's not that easy as just plugging tools. Uh, this is the bug that we found in specification, one of them. Uh, what do you think is wrong in here? Uh, this is a, a function that checks that a, a byte buffer is valid. And guess what? There is this highlighted red thing, so this must be wrong. Okay, and so what was wrong here in this specification? A buffer has a capacity how much memory it's allocated and then how much it's used. If a buffer is good, everything up to capacity should be usable. The mistake here is they said, no, no, everything up to length should be usable. Okay. So this should be capacity. That's, that's where the problem is. Remarkably, this broken one, the one up to length, that was perfectly fine for, um, uh, for all of the unit tests. There's also unit testing, so that was all fine. And in all of the verifications, uh, it also was all fine. And the underlying reason why it was fine is that uh, when they were building it in the very beginning, you have to decide how to model malloc. And they decided that they're going to model malloc as never failing. You call malloc, it always returns you something. Why? It's easier that way. And then they left it like that in some cases. And in others, they've extended malloc to possibly also fail. And the only time it so happens where this causes a problem in the code, if some malloc fails, and now your capacity is different. So your length is zero, your capacity is not zero, but malloc failed, so you didn't allocate up to your capacity, and then there could be problems. Because we started from scratch and we said, okay, we have a factor out allocator, we're gonna have like one option allocator, it sometimes fails, never fails. We got a counter example. We started to look through counter example. We discovered the bug is actually in this code note. In. This is a bug that, um, uh, uh, right, okay. So uh, one of the things that, that causes us to do is to start looking back at vacuity, which is very you know, different techniques to try and uh, check whether you actually verified what you expect to verify. And so here, because the precondition is too strong, uh, the way we actually found that there were some assertions that we knew that should be failing, but they weren't. Uh, and so we turned it into a tool option where we check for every assertion that at the very least it's reachable. And that helps discover such things early on, some problems in your specification, but it's only up to a point. It's still, uh, it's still uh, very much uh, an open question of what to do. Here's a bug that we found uh, that they refused to fix. So here, what you want to do is you want to check whether a bunch of uh, a buffer is full of zeros. How do you do it? Well, the easiest way to do it, the fastest way to do it is you pick a word size in your machine. And then what you do is you check whether the first word is zero, then the next word is zero, then the next word is zero. It doesn't matter whether you allocated bytes or integers or whatever, you check word by word. Well, how do you do the check word by word? 
The simplest way is you cast whatever you have into pointer of words, and then you read individual words. The unfortunate thing is that this is an undefined behavior in C. C is actually a very strong type system, and it says you can only read something from the same type that you've written. So if you've written a byte into memory, you can only read it as a byte. You can't read it as a word. And so a compiler is free to replace this read by nothing. Unfortunately, the compiler is not smart enough, uh, and it doesn't. And so the developer says, this works, always work, will always work. This is a fix. The fix is really simple. All you have to do is to say, if you want to access this value, uh, don't just read it, but do a map copy. And then you can do whatever you want. As when you compile this code, and this code will be compiled to equal assembly, right? Like um, this is not going to be an extra map copy call. It's just going to protect the possible undefined behavior. And the developers uh, don't want to change it. They say, this works. This is tested. Go away. We found it because our compiler is smarter because we add a lot of extra LS analysis. And so our compiler is smarter. It can detect things. Uh, well, actually, so yeah. We give more smarts to default LLVM compiler so its optimizer gets more powerful. And it optimizes this program, causing uh, a counter example because you say I zero memory and this memory all zero. And you say this because uh, this gets, um, uh, gets uh, compiled out. But the production compiler is not smart enough and nobody cares. So this is, again, this is one of those de, de facto semantics versus um, um, the C semantics. According to C semantics, this is bad. According to all developers, it works. And therefore, it's... All right, so I think I'm out of time. So I'm just going to uh, quickly go to... Uh, this is our case study. So this is uh, like the different tools that we all hooked up together. It all works. It's all in a Docker. It's all alive. You can go and play with it. Uh, it's pretty fun. Um, I won't talk about CBMC because I ran out of time. I talked too much. Uh, ask me afterwards if you want. This is my fancy slide with the transformation that I promised, how we go from code into this verification condition. This is the one that likes CBMC. It's all data. If you stop at any one point, you're going to be more like Boogie. So that's what I was planning, uh, claiming to talk about, but didn't. Uh, this is uh, our extension to the architecture where we add extra bytes to memory and pointers. So we say, why should our memory and pointers be like 64 bits? They can be bigger. And if I want to mark objects and I want to say this object has a red mark or this one is secret or this is sensitive, I don't have to worry about how to fit it into my limited space. Uh, which is uh, actually quite useful. Uh, this is how the structure looks. This is our fancy times. Uh, I'm pointing out that, look, we are so much faster than everybody else, uh, but it has to be with a lot of, uh, well, with a lot of salt. Um, so tools like Klee, for example, the unit proofs are really bad for Klee. Klee wants to know allocated sizes up front. We want to know everything works between ranges of sizes. That makes CLI really suffer because we have to tell it, try all possible allocations. That's one reason why it's uh, so much slower. For some cases where it's not the case, um, you won't see it in here, but it's, it's somewhere oh, it's, it's somewhere in here. You won't see it, it's too small. You'll see that when something is really good for CLI, it's amazing. It's like flying, whereas um, uh, all symbolic tools go far, far behind. Um, and the difference say here and here, uh, there's twofold. We do check different properties uh, because every tool has its own embedded property that it checks. Uh, here it seems that our modeling of things like mem copy and mem move is better, and we win in some of the places. Overall, the times are very similar, but where mem copy and mem move are important, our encoding seems really better. So we've analyzed a few cases for that. Uh, Rust, if you're interested, again, talk to me. So this is our new thing. We're getting into Rust because everybody's getting into Rust. It's supposed to be super reliable. There's uh, all kind of cool tweets from people about how you solve all the problems, just use Rust. And then uh, it goes into Linux. But then uh, if you actually uh, try to do something in Rust, you realize that the only way to do things in Rust is to use its unsafe feature. 
and then all of the safety graces go away. And it, it, it takes it, it takes a while to discover it if you come from outside. If you're very excited, and then you say, let me implement a graph. And if you try to implement a graph in Rust, you discover it's not possible, uh, not in the safe Rust. Uh, and so now it gets us back into that, well, then let's build BMC for us. Because uh, if there's unsafe components and nobody knows what happens to them, this is what, what we're doing. Uh, we live in LLVM, so that's nice for us. So we've built uh, just over the summer this pipeline to get from Rust uh, into LLVM bitcode uh, and then throw it into Seahorn. It sort of works. Uh, right now, we're kind of in the stage where we're analyzing everything. And so it was just a, an executable. So we compile to a nice structured trust into a really scary LLVM, and then our tools can analyze over it. So you compile itself or you use the software? We use uh, the same, uh, we use like LLVM infrastructure. Rust is already built on top of LLVM. So we just tap into this and eventually extract good uh, Bitcoin. Do you have any massaging there? Do you help the compiler? Uh, not that much. Yeah, I mean, regarding this, I saw there are, um, I mean, there are normal Boolean formulas in except for assumptions and assertions. How are these compiled to LLVM? Do you, because I assume before, maybe you, what you were doing, you were compiling those conditions differently. Yep. Okay, so basically you have access to those formulas in their structure form. I'm not sure because I'm not an expert in LLVM, but so everything gets compiled to LLVM and then we just, uh, because in the BMC, we completely support the semantics of everything. We just process them. But for example, uh, let's say the, the, the short circuiting end. Yep. Does that compile to a branching code? Yep. You know, yep. Right? So basically, what you do you sort of, for example, if it's on assumptions, you assume that the condition, the, the point where the condition is true is reachable. I'm not sure not that... reachable, but we assume if you reach it, then it's going to be true. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And some of the, the things that they skipped, some of the code transformation, they sort of uh, highlight that thing. Uh, but yeah, so uh, what, what you may be asking is uh, how do we know that they're compiled correctly? But we don't, Just we trust the compiler. And the second is that, well, one of the conditions which are conceptually sort of simple, you take X and Y and Z, and uh, now they become some complicated code. They do. And then whenever we compile that uh, into verification conditions, some of the transformation we do get them back uh, because we sort of make things more data-driven, more independent. And then it just becomes, how do you represent the verification conditions? So, so yeah, it, it is. Uh, uh, we may end up taking something that is uh, a big con a big conjunction event, and then that's going to get represented by complicated code, which we then represent back by some kind of formula, uh, and maybe we're spending extra time doing that. Uh, but it hasn't been an issue, so that's why we haven't. Like it, it's it's been an issue for other tools, yeah, uh, for other our tools. So when the tools are not very precise, you sometimes, for example, have to say, no, break this assertion into two, because if it's an end, uh, it's going to create a problem for us. We just want to have us uh, assume and then another issue. In, in here, the only problem could be is uh, performance, that if you write it one way, it's going to be more performant. And that has not been a problem. So we haven't. Uh... Yeah, these stepped out functions. Why is it? separate from just source code. Oh, because in general, when you do this, even in a, in a previous case, uh, whenever you build this um, uh, unit proof, uh, you'll say that, well, what if certain things are just too hard to verify? I still want to do something. So for example, when we were verifying um, uh, priority queue, uh, whenever you insert something into a priority queue, you need to reshuffle it. Uh, so you need to uh, bubble elements so that they're in, in the right order. That's really expensive. And if you're doing, doing memory safety, you don't really care about this. You just want to prove that the bubble function is correct in, in an arbitrary state. 
And then you just need to know that when you call it, uh, it will not modify, like it won't make create new pointers. It will just rearrange the, the existing ones. And so for verifying open, open search, you would want to uh, stop the bubble function by some other version. So this is what stopped out functions are. So this is <laughs> functions of the uh, original code that for some reason we can't verify and we want to replace them with another version for verification purposes. So you start without them, you want them to be empty. Uh, you have a C entry point because we discovered the trust entry point is really complex and just had lots of extra features just in case, which we don't want. Uh, and so we start with the C entry point, Rust as a library inside C that gives us a, a small, uh, like fairly reasonable LLVM to analyze. If this has functions that we don't want, they come on the side here and they being stubbed up as part of this uh, linking. This is all compiles with link time optimizations, which is a feature that they've added for LLVM to be able to have multiple translation units stuck together and then optimized at once, which means LLVM is preserved until the very end. And we just grab that LLVM and start analyzing it. So um, yeah, let me, uh, in case of, OK, so I'll show you something that you can then ask me questions about. That's my last slide. Uh, so conclusion. So uh, like this was our, my first experience really playing with BUC, trying to build one. It's uh, a lot of fun. Uh, problem strength really... mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, 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 is it's really something that can um, uh, empower developers to write their own specifications. It comes together with being executable. So you can also have executable counter examples, which is uh, means that instead of just giving loads and loads of explanations of why something fails, you can give them something that runs and then can load this in the debugger and see and explore and decide whether they uh, trust it or not. Uh, and it can be used to share specifications within different uh, quality assurance tools. You just have to be careful how you write it uh, so that the specifications can fit multiple tools. Uh, bug in specification, that's still a big uh, problem. Uh, we found simple things, uh, simple sanity checks really helpful. Uh, but I think that's still very, very uh, unresearched area. Like what other things you can do, what guarantees you can provide. Uh, in CBMC, for example, they have a notion of coverage and they produce nice uh, HTML report to what's covered. And when we discovered our bug, uh, we went to see whether the coverage would also have found that something is missing. And it was. And they had this nice report that was saying like this line of code is not covered. And it's been up in a nice web thing for two years. Nobody looks. Uh, with our vacuity, at least it comes out as uh, it points out to less things, but more aggressive. Uh, so it really says this is about just fix it. Uh, whereas with coverage, it was much more flexible. It's like, okay, nothing, not everything will be covered all the time anyway. So, uh, and then uh, we have this new bounded model checker, CBMC. Uh, it's um, actually a lot of fun. It supports a lot of uh, LLVM features um, compared to sort of other tools. Performance is pretty good. Uh, and uh, we're now starting to play with Rust. We have a whole bunch of uh, blog posts on this. There is a, a repository called CRust. Uh, we've done quite a bit of verification of the standard library, um, verifying little, um, uh, little data structures like uh, tiny vector and small vector. Uh, various things that pack and unpack um, data around. There's uh, marshalling and unmarshalling libraries. I'm looking for other, uh, what, what would be another interesting case study? So something that uses Rust and uses it in a very low level way. Okay, so something that relies on a lot of unsafe uh, that then other components. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so let's have some questions. Do I have one? So the new C, BNC, uh, does it use C form or it's kind of? No, it's very much easy. Uh, so uh, I will uh, explain this in the slide. Um, so here. <laughs> Not
So, uh, so Seahorn is this, this whole thing. Uh, and so the BMC part is here at the very end. So it uses all of this part. So for example, uh, we do particular kind of LS analysis and we divide memory into regions. So we use that division of memory uh, to generate memory objects. In uh, CBMC, for example, they divide, they have an array for each memory object. We have an array for each group of memory objects. And so that just changes how, how things are. Uh, a lot of the transformation that we have, they're shared between the different engines, the build system, the stubbing of functions. Um, Do you use great interpolation? Uh, no, 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 no. So, so no, so, so just, just, just straight, straight, straight BMC. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because you had used, oh, you stopped using great interpolation. Uh, you no, are... okay. So, inter okay. So, this talk was about uh, how to get um, uh, really just so right. vanilla BMC, okay. uh, but get it to work fast. Okay. Uh, we didn't do it before because when we started on Seahorn, there was another project called uh, LLBMC that was only focusing on BMC for LLVM. And we said, okay, great. So, they'll do that part and we'll use it when we want to. Uh, they went commercial and disappeared off the web. Uh, and so after some time, it became like we have no other tools. Now there is also a tool called uh, Crux from Galois uh, that also targets all of them. Um, so I, I don't know what our competition is with them. Uh, they target more towards uh, their crypto uh, usage, uh, but it's a generic framework, so I don't know. Uh, how, how it is. Uh, in terms of interpolation themselves, I've done a whole bunch of work on interpolations. Uh, should have some of you. Uh, but we, so you, but you, yeah, we, we, you we, we, we sort of stop with it uh, in, in here because uh, there aren't good enough tools to support interpolance. Uh, and so okay. we've. <laughs> So this uh, Martin might even uh, of course uh, talk about it. So the TPA procedure which allows to go very, very deep with BMC. So it would be very handy there. Right, right but then so uh, you have interpolance uh, and good engines. Right. So we use these three yeah, because they don't have interpolance. Mm -hmm. So then you're saying, okay, use our engine. Okay, right. so we have to pick up to your engine and then it has to be. <laughs> Right, or like I, I had the interpolants for SAT, uh, which were done in a good way, but they're only for SAT. Um, maybe I have a question related to that. So in your encoding, you're using bit vectors, as you said, as the slide says, right? Yes. Yeah, so yeah, the interpolation for bit vectors, I guess, is hard. Yep, that's also been... Um, and so it's only bit vectors, or do you also have arrays and maybe ADTs? Or uh, no ADTs. Uh, and uh, in terms of arrays, we have uh, so two and a half. We have one encoding that uses arrays, one encoding that uses lambda functions, which we eagerly compile out. So by the time it hits a solver, there are no lambda functions already. And then we have a third one. Uh, this is that Jiang did, which is in a development branch. It wasn't. Uh, I finished enough for him to write a master thesis and do experiments, not finished enough for me to accept it in our code base, uh, that uh, tries to create a new theory that uh, is more of a theory of pointers and memory rather than arrays. So theory where you have uh, basic operations like read a word, read an eight byte word, read a one byte word, or write a white, one byte, write eight bytes, uh, do mem copy, this kind of things. Okay, thanks. And uh, with arrays, what we found is that uh, in our experience, theory of arrays is terrible. So we do, whenever we use theory of arrays, if we go to Z3, it's really bad. Uh, if we go to Yikes or Bulletter, they compile arrays. Uh, either they don't support them or compile them out to uh, Lambdas. Uh, and if we go to Lambdas, then everybody is good. So kind of disappointed with theory of arrays. Uh, in our, our setting. Yep. In terms of the last slide, I have more of a high level question about the usage of the limit test. 
uh, yeah, I find the idea very interesting, and I understand the, the motivation to try to have a specification closer to the developer because, as you pointed out, like writing specifications is hard. But um, I'm wondering, yeah, you pointed out one of the benefits being that we can then reuse it for different tools. But you also pointed out that when well, you have that, you tweak the specifications for different tools, and that would require knowledge of the tool that you're tweaking for. So, isn't that like kind of like conflicting? Uh, well, there's no magic, but my feeling is, at least from you know my, my own experience uh, of myself, uh, is that developers are really good at understanding different um, uh, constraints of different environments, as long as they're common to what they use. Right? So, for example, you say performance. Oh, don't use modulo. Or the opposite, uh, use module. Right? They can all design your code in such a way that uh, you could say, I want the component here that say initializes two numbers in such a way that one number is less than the other, and make this component modular so that you can plug different implementations. So there's two parts here. One is how do you design uh, your, because your specification becomes code. And so how do you refactor your code? The good thing is that developers already know how to refactor code. So they can do this, you can you know, sort of communicate with them what we would like to refactor. And then it becomes, okay, now how do we implement this particular component? And then at some point, yeah, you can say like this components uh, for some tool, they may not be obvious for them uh, how to do it, but it's already limited to that particular, particular part. But like I can say, this tool has this extra intrinsic that lets you, you know, specify something simpler. Use it. This tool doesn't. Don't. But first, we agree on what is the specification and how we refactor. Right? Like, what are the key functions that need to implement? What what do they do? Maybe we have a simple implementation that just works that we can use in fuzzy. And then every other implementation, we add saying, okay, it should be functionally the same, but should be tweaked in something. I think that the, the, the ability to run specs is really important. That's uh, uh, like another thing I haven't talked about here is that you also need to build models of environment sometimes, less for this one, more for follow-up works. And then you build this model and if it's only used by tools, you just completely unsure of what's going on. Uh, if you don't have any tests, you don't know how it works at all. But everything is very uh, uh, suspicious. Uh, and if it's code, you can at the very least run it. You can run things in the fuzzer. You could see what happens. It gives you more confidence. And then the rest becomes refactoring and restructuring and re-optimizing. Like for example, the instance I gave uh, with uh, fuzzer and 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 and, and Seahorn. So you get one, either that one or that one. You can use it for both tools. It's just not going to be very effective for one. But now it becomes optimized if you're just saying, okay, I want the same thing, but how do I make it better for the tool? Right? You go online, you go to tool developer, you tell them, I'd like to do this, but faster. The developers are used to this is the normal way to work with things. They get something working, then you go to uh, experts, go on Stack Overflow and say, I want this, but better. Uh, you mentioned you have a different SD encoding store from mm -hmm. solid. Is there so like are you doing it in some smart way? So you like kind of okay for this problem, this SMT encoding is better. For this problem, this SMT encoding is better. Or just not that uh, not that smart. No, no. Okay, so like how was that? How, how do you use the different SMT encodings? What's the point? Uh, that would be the question, like. Uh, no, so uh, we have. Uh, uh, I'm not gonna. Let's see if I show this on the slide. You can see the three. Um, 
Let's say we have this uh, file with options. And so there's lots of options and each one tweaks something in the encoding. Okay. And so then you run it on an input and, and you see how it performs. And then if it performs not so good, you see if you can change the encoding. And then you change the encoding for this file. That's a, another reason why our running time is maybe so much better than other tools. Because mm -hmm. and 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 we believe that this is the right way to go. That and we see the same with AWS. If your goal is to do this in production, nobody really cares whether you happen to have like one set of options that works everywhere, or you fine tune your options for different benchmarks. That is, you know, if you need to fine tune, fine tune. What I want is that like I have a nightly run and that it runs quickly. Uh, and so, so far we've been fine tuning it. Uh, so here's uh, examples. Uh, how do you model memory? You can model memory as some kind of an array or a lambda, but before that, uh, what is one access? Is that an array of bytes? Or is that an array of four byte words? Or is that an array of eight byte words? Well, it depends what you do. If you're storing integers in memory, it's nice if a single store is, is, is white. But if you're working with strings, it's the other way around because it gets, if you do mem copy of a string and it's in, in, a, in, a, in, in big words, it gets really complicated because you have to account where the string is. And so we have an option for that. Most of the time we use wide memory mm -hmm. and for operations that have a lot of strings in it and some kind of string functions, we use this one byte memory. And you could automatically try and figure out which one would be better. We didn't write this code, we just mm -hmm. sort of pick. Okay. Uh, same uh, with uh, solvers. We know that certain encodings are good for certain solvers. And so if we say, oh, if we're going to run this three here, uh, then use this option. So if we're going to run YAX, use this other option. Basically, many of two boards. Yeah. So what, what I'm happy about is uh, not how many options we have, but that under the hood, it's not like for every option we have its own file. It's actually very nicely combined that there's a nice simple number of transformations and simple building blocks that can be combined in a variety of ways. Mm -hmm. And every way is meaningful. Not all of them are good, but each one is meaningful. You don't affect the sounds. Okay. And now you can play with these options. Uh, doing this more automatically, picking options to benchmark, yeah, that um, would be interesting, but um, maybe it needs more data for that. Sure. Second question is how, like, I, I still didn't understand exactly how did you verify the specification? So you basically wrote your own specification that just showed that. So what happened here is uh, uh, two things. One is because we were redoing what they were doing. Yes. Uh, some of our assumptions were more general, and mm -hmm. we discovered that they had assumptions mm -hmm. uh, of the overall environment that were too restrictive, and therefore their uh, specification that was wrong wasn't exhibiting the problem because it was assume the environment, namely malloc never fails, assume that the list is valid, do something. Mm -hmm. uh, and when uh, malloc doesn't fail, their specification was strong enough mm -hmm. to show that things won't happen. We said malloc can fail, then their specification was not strong enough okay. under this environment, and, and we found it. So we found the bug by chance, like this, just by redoing it. Yes. Yeah, so what we did afterwards is we said uh, one thing that we remember from some early work that I've done is there's this notion of acuity. It's really big in uh, temporal logic model checking, uh, where people were saying we write this really complicated temporal formulas, and all we know is that they're satisfied. How do we know that they're satisfied? Not for some strange reason we don't like. Vacuity came as one way to do it. And the vacuity basically says, check if a simpler property also holds. If you prove that your complicated property holds because it is implied by a simpler one, well, then something is wrong. Either just write the simpler property, or uh, maybe the property gets simplified because uh, there's something wrong, like it's not the right property. And the way it becomes, uh, uh, the way it reflects in, in, in this work, uh, the vacuity here ends up being that if an assertion can be satisfied because it's unreachable, then it's vacuous. So you put assertion inside that code. The assert will be satisfied. That's good. But it's independent of what you assert. Okay. 
to the survey we did. Yeah. And so we added this as a as a as an extra check. So we now check for every assertion. We also have another assertion to check that it's reachable. Yeah. So for every assert, we check whether assert false would also work. Uh, and we show with this kind of check, we would have found the original problem. We did find other problems that we made, uh, but now all we can do is we can tell you that vacuity passes, mm -hmm. but I don't know that everything is fine. Okay. Right? And my own experience with this is when you start, you write this unit proof, you're very focused on it, you make mistakes, you very much know what's going on and you're likely to get it fairly good. And then later you come or somebody else come and says, oh, I'm going to improve it. Uh, I'm going to like the code looks just too, I'm just going to refactor. Mm -hmm. And that's where lots of problems happen because when you refactor, you change, uh, all you do is you get to run your verification job again and you see how oh, it's still possible. And, and, and actually you don't know whether maybe you did something that like you've broken it, but in a way that it passes more often. And so vacuity helps. Uh, we did we do discover things with it, uh, but it's just, Just one thing. Okay, thanks. No more questions? Mm -hmm. One more. Uh, in, the, in one of the first slides, I noticed, um, well, in the slide showing the, the workflow of, uh, of uh, Seahor, I saw there are um, there, is, there are two steps. One is uh, virtual code code virtualization. Mm -hmm. And the other is exception lowering, mm -hmm. I think. Yep. And yes, I'm interested about these steps. Is does the virtualization al allow CR to also verify the behavior, but to some extent verify the behavior of um, programs that use more object-oriented features? Mm -hmm. And if so, uh, what do you use for um uh, for deciding uh, which method is dispatched. And for exception lowering, uh, is it, uh, I mean, what, what sounds to me? So the exception lowering is the easiest thing. It just, we, uh, LLVM has special control flow instruction for exceptions, mm -hmm. uh, and we just change them into uh, uh, just jumps and okay. right? just, just compile them down so we don't have to do them. Yes. Uh, for uh, the virtualization, one of the things that we have is we have a fairly robust uh, LS analysis framework. Uh, it is uh, actually independent, so we uh, decided to make it in such a way that you can use it independently of Seahorn. And uh, there's a group at Amazon that uses it. Smart is using it. Uh, it does LS analysis and then devirtualization based on that. Yeah. And so we did play and try various things uh, to do better virtualization for C++ based on um, sort of understanding how the virtual tables are laid out. It helps a bit um, to a point. But at, at the end of the day, we uh, get clusters of uh, LS classes, and then we replace each um, uh, virtual call uh, by a switch and direct calls. So the switch becomes if an address equal this one, uh, LS is this one, then call this function, otherwise call this function, otherwise call this function. Mm -hmm. And then depending on what tool you use afterwards, if you use something like BMC, it's very precise, it will just call the right function. If you use something like abstract interpreter, it may then say, oh, I'm calling one of the functions in this class, and, and it will just you know, prove a property that's true under any calls. Okay. All right, I guess that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so we can uh, then here to the floor and uh,